Hello, this is Professor Bustilia Booth. This is our week three to four wrap up, and this will be part one, focusing in on business ethics. What you'll see here are the topics that will be covered uh, in three parts because we went through over you know, four chapters. I wanna make sure the videos are manageable, so I will deliver them in three parts. So in this particular video, I will focus in on uh, business ethics and social responsibility. And I will particularly discuss Wills Fargo as a case to bring home, you know, the main concepts of, of this particular chapter. And uh, I'll also just remind folks that we did during week three, and I'll just quickly go over it now, I did prepare a video on the upcoming projects. Uh, there are five stages to that project are on a secret shopper. And if you haven't already watched that video, I highly encourage you to do that or revisit it again because it goes through the instructions on how to do it and where to find the assignments themselves. Okay, so let me go ahead and go into part one and the concern around business ethics. So ethics has sort of a central notion of morality and the question of whether things that are legal and are they always moral or do they need to be legal in order to be moral? And at the heart of ethics is really this idea of integrity, the sense that one will act, uh, you know, and do what's right, regardless of whether anyone is looking. And that integrity breeds trust. So I want you to hang on to this notion as we go through uh, the slides, because we'll, we'll go back to it again. So let's go with some definitions. What is best business ethics? Business ethics really are the principles and standards that determine acceptable conduct in business. So that's really important, this idea of acceptability, right? And business ethics is distinguished from the idea of personal ethics, that an individual has a set of values and principles and also standards of conduct. And those two are not necessarily the same, although there are great overlaps. And that acceptability in business are really determined by the internal organization and outside stakeholders. And when we talk about outside stakeholders, we're talking about customers, competitors, government regulators, interest groups, and the general public. So you probably heard of Enron, and it's a great story about the rise and fall of a great company. They were established in 1985 as an energy corporation and then rapidly went into the telecom industry and they got caught up in a market run and in order to appear to be more profitable than they were so they can keep their market valuation they created fake off the book corporations to hide its losses it's a kind of accounting trick and they were able to do this with the assistance of their accounting firm it was called anderson and finally it did get caught up with them and the regulators uh find their executives and some of them went to jail. And not only did the investors lose everything, employees also lost everything because their retirement, okay, the retirement uh, funds were structured to have Enron stocks. So when Enron fell, they lost all of their pensions. And it was, it was very, very sad. And so this led to the passage of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, which protects investors from the very fraudulent accounting activities that Enron used. And so now it requires strict reporting requirements that make sure the accounting reports are validated. All right, so a more recent ethical matter uh, that you may have seen across the social media, because it was absolutely everywhere, is that of what happened with Mr. Dow in a United Airlines flight. And as you can see here, he was being dragged through the aisles. And really what happened was that the airlines had the legal right to have passengers be removed from a flight in order to accommodate their employees in order for them to be able to show up to work, in this case, to Kentucky. But in this case, uh, Mr. Dow refused to give up his seat 
And so a law enforcement officer was called to you know, assist his removal, but again, he refused. And in that process, he got hurt and then got dragged down this aisle and uh, there were stakeholders there with cameras, captured the whole thing and then sent this you know, across social media. And the question really was, you know, even though United Airlines had the legal right to do what they did, the manner in which they did it appeared to, uh, to those around them to be amoral because it caused uh, Mr. Dow harm. And they, uh, you know, fast forward a little bit, United Airlines and Mr. Dow have now come to an agreement to settle this out of court and it's an undisclosed amount, uh, but you can imagine that it costs far more than the seats that were supposedly given up. Focus in on Wells Fargo, because that is also in the news and has been in the news. And so Wells Fargo, uh, let's just establish some information, was established in 1852. It's an old company and it is a U.S.-based international banking and financial services institution. And according to Force Magazine in 2016, it's the seventh largest public company. And according to Bloomberg Magazine last year, it's the second largest bank internationally. So they're, they're huge, okay? And that between 2007 and 2016, their CEO was John Stumpf. And he took home you know, an annual salary of $19 million um, that was reported in 2015. Okay, so what happened? In December 21st, 2013, the Los Angeles Times report uh, reported of an unhealthy pressure cooker environment, a sales culture environment within Wells Fargo. Okay, and that, uh, and then it, it caused uh, California and, f and federal regulatory uh, agencies to investigate what this, what, what this was all about. And what they found was that their pressure cooker environment created a culture that was vulnerable to corruption and that there was widespread unethical behavior and that thousands of their employees secretly created 2 million fake accounts without customer knowledge, which led to overdrafts and fees. And the bank profited about $5 million over five years during this practice. I want you to remember that number. Five million. And what was the driver? It was to meet aggressive sales goals. And these sales goals basically came from the top with this idea of, you know, eight is great and, uh, and a great initiative. And basically it was to increase average number of financial products customers would, hold, would have from six to eight. Now, the industry usually, you know, some of the average is that you know, folks would have about three accounts, the average kinds of accounts, uh, banking accounts. And, but the uh, culture promoted this idea of getting at least eight accounts. And why the number eight? The report, the report found is that because it rhymed with the word great. So they could have, you know, this mantra, which Stumpf basically said a lot to folks to encourage them to get on board, is that eight is great. And he would often say that to employees. And so the whole culture sort of went around this idea of getting eight accounts. All right. And so then they started um, uh, creating ethics problems within the organization. And so after the investigations, uh, and it took three years to kind of find out all this information. By September 8, 2016, uh, the regulatory agencies found out about these two million accounts and fined the bank $185 million. Remember, they only made five, so-called made and profited $5 million. And this, uh, you know, aid is great initiative over five years. And now they have to find to, to pay $185 million. And so John Stump was uh, called to the Senate to testify in September 20, 2016. So this is last year, uh, uh, in 26. So recently, he says, testifies before the U.S. Senate. And who you see here is Elizabeth, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren calling for criminal investigations. She read the report and she said, you know, this is criminal. 
and tells Stumpf to give up stock and resign. Well, about a week later, he does, uh, he does give up uh, his awards, his outstanding, outstanding stock worth about $41 million. $41 million. And a few weeks later, he does indeed step down because the scandal is now widespread and well known to all. Okay. And then a couple, uh, a few months later, San Francisco, where Wells Fargo is actually, you know, it's its hometown, bars, the, bars Wells Fargo from doing city business for two years. And so what was this culture really about? We talked about the idea of pressure cooker to meet our overly aggressive goals and performance measures and increased anxiety within Wells Fargo. And then you have to ask yourself, you know, how could good people create fake accounts? I mean, there were thousands of them. How could they do this? And so they were pressured to do it. And in order to be able to do it, they went to self-protection mode and they became morally disengaged. And so they separated themselves from the business and the personal interests. So they rationalize, oh, it's just business. And so they eliminated their personal feelings, their values, their ethics from the professional situation. And some of them said, you know, it's kind of good for me and you know, I get to keep my job and it's unlikely to harm others. So there's rationalization involved. Remember that business ethics can be very different from personal ethics. Okay. And so, and, 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 you know, through these investigations, people were interviewed and here are some of the things that people said, you know, there would be days where we would open five checking accounts for friends and family just to go home early. And you got to ask yourself what kind of, of culture must be present for, uh, uh, professionals to, you know, open fake accounts for friends and family just so that they can go home early. Okay. And so people in a way had to segment, right? Remember, create those two people, segment the reality versus home and work. And to preserve the positive self image, they had to adopt two different roles, two different people to avoid the guilt that they were feeling inside and to make up for it later. later. I, I just got to get through this now, you know, mentality. And that among the flock was this quiet preservation. I just got to get through it. But some people, though, uh, decided to have integrity and to exercise in their integrity and, and uh, report it and say, look, look, this isn't right. But got pushed back and was bullied in this case. Heather Brock um, was fired for coming up and saying, you know, I just don't want to do this. This isn't right. And she was bullied and retaliated against for reporting the sales of uh, integrity issues. And so other, and here are some quotes from other uh, employees where, you know, they, they were, they, they had um, suffered greatly from having to be put under pressure to commit things that they absolutely did not believe in. So in this case, Susan Fisher said, it was an extremely dark period for me. I took medical leave due to the pressure. And medical leave has its own costs, right? Okay. And then here's another cost to an individual. Um, this individual went to depression and even contemplated suicide after losing their job because they refused to do what they were asked to do because they also wanted to be, to have integrity. And then here are some folks, another employee says, you know, it was a dark, it was the most degrading place to work. I still feel sick to my stomach. Every time I drive by a Wells Fargo branch, I suspect she no longer has a Wells Fargo account. Okay. And so let's take a look at how it is that this great company has been around since, you know, the 1800s got to here. Here's a brochure in 2015. All right, take, take, very, uh, take a good close look at this brochure. And these are the vision and values of Wells Fargo. And uh, in it, it has, you know, sort of its value principles, leadership, diversity, inclusion, people as advantage, as a competitive advantage. And they have a back page where to talk about the rest of their values. In that, 
brochure, immediately as you open it, there will be this quote which says, regardless of our growing size, scope and reach, our common vision and distinct values form the fabric that holds us together, wherever we are, whatever we do. It sounds great, right? It sounds great. And then in it, he continues to say, the reason we wake up in the morning is to help our customers succeed financially and to satisfy their financial needs. And the result is that we make money. It's never the other way around. Now you can already see there, given what we have found, what the finding, the regular regulator, regulators found, that there's a disconnect, right? There's a disconnect in that statement. And you don't need to read all of this. I highlighted some pieces that are important. This is their value statement. And I just want to bring your attention to this idea of we still make decisions based on our common understanding of our culture and what we stand for. Okay, our common understanding of our culture and what we stand for. And um, Wells Fargo indeed uh, has a very strong culture. And in this case, it was a pressure cooker culture and it was reinforced. And in here, it has five primary values and ethics is one of them. Okay, just note that. And then if you were to open the, uh, continue reading um, their, their manual, you'll see that they tout this notion, this is 2015, that our customers trust us as their financial resource. And you can read the rest and it says, and they trust us, all of us to act as risk managers and we have to earn that trust every day by behaving ethically. So they recognize the importance of ethics. However, the exercise of that was another matter. This is the back page of the brochure and you'll find here our vision. We want to satisfy our customers' financial needs and help them succeed financially. And, uh, and here are the other two uh, values. What's right for our customers and ethics here at the bottom. And immediately before the last page, so this is the back page right here, the brochure, this is what it says, which I think is intriguing and worth noting. Our foundation for success can be summarized in three beliefs in who we are and what we do. Our product is service, our value added is financial guidance, our competitive advantage of our people. And then it says, our formula for greatness starts and ends with people. Mind share plus heart share equals market share. And you know, note this uh, notion, market share. Well, we know at the, the end of 2016, or actually the beginning, uh, uh, 20, at the end of 2016, John Stump, uh, you know, stepped down as CEO and he was replaced. Here's the 2017 brochure. Looks very different. It almost looks like it's going back to 1852 with its stagecoach. And here's what it says now inside as you open it. Regardless of our growing size, scope, and reach, we must never lose sight of putting our customer first and helping them succeed financially. Gone was that idea of culture, very common to us all. And then here's their value statement, a lot. Um, a lot more succinct and the same five pillars and here's what they now talk about in their ethics as opposed to our customers trust us they say we want our customers to trust us we want our customers to trust all of us and we have to earn that trust every day by behaving ethically and then this last statement that's more important now than ever so they have recognized they have lost the trust because they did not act with integrity. They did not, you know, get up every morning. The reason for being is to provide financial, you know, um, security for their uh, customers and then, and the result that they would make money. They had reversed that in fact. And so now they have to start over. And so this is now the back of their brochure, a lot simpler. It is almost as if they're starting anew. And so if you open, you know, again, this is the pay, this statement here is at the, um, just before the back page 
here. And note the difference. Our formula for greatness starts and ends with people. Gone is a statement about market share. This is the aftermath now for Wells Fargo for behaving unethically. In addition to 185 million fine, they have to pay 5 million in remediation for the affected bank customers. All right, so they lost that profit. They fired 5,300 lower level employees and managers, fired four current, former, uh, current and former senior managers. They lost their bonuses, stock options, all of that. It wiped $20 billion from the bank's market value. And the upcoming litigation cost estimates are about $1.7 billion. But CEO Stumpf um, actually come out, came out of it okay. He got $124 million as a payout. That is a cost to Wells Fargo. The profit from the practice was $5 million. The cost from these practices was $22 plus billion and counting. This is not over plus lost customers. So unethical practices in this case can really cost a lot. And like Enron, Wells Fargo also got caught up in the market. Okay, let's visit the idea of the nature of social responsibility because these are linked. There are four stages of social responsibility, according to the book. That idea of financial e and economic. You know, businesses are expected to make a profit. And then that second stage is legal. You're also expected to comply with the law, right? And your third is the idea of ethics, doing the right thing. Doing the right thing, whether or not the, there is a legal foundation of it or not the idea of integrity, doing the right thing when nobody else is necessarily looking. And then the fourth stage is philanthropy. You know, so the voluntary actions that promote human welfare or goodwill. And collectively, this is known as corporate citizenship. Not just one of these, but all of them. All right. And here are some corporate citizenship trends. And there are around the idea of health, and rights. So for example, your book brings up CVS. They're eliminating tobacco products to align with their image of health care. To them, it didn't make sense. I mean, they're going to lose a lot of money to take this out of their pharmacies, but it aligns with their image of health care, health. Starbucks offers ever more natural fair trade products. And it's also in alignment with this environmental and community stewardship image. Okay, this idea of health, the natural, and rights of people to be able to make an economic uh, living, to make enough money to, to live. And then Patagonia and the out, uh, an out, out you know, uh, making of outdoor clothing has green products and also has fair trade practices because they're mission driven to cause no unnecessary harm. Okay. To them, you know, the great outdoors sort of promotes health and that, um, you know, people who create their products for them have economic rights and so does the environment. And closer to home, Wilcox family farms are shifting to 100% organic cage free hens. And they're in their sense is that there are animal rights and that sustainable farming uh, as an economic model works and that they are going to be humane in the process. Okay, These are corporate citizenship trends and they're not legally based, they're integrity and value based driven. There's a great shift uh, in our culture where more and more um, customers are looking for those kinds of companies that align with their values around health and rights, whether that be environmental rights, economic rights, or animal rights and the like. Okay, and so there, then there is this growing notion then, particularly in the 
younger generations that business good ought to equal public good and and what it means is you know being uh, debated but it is moving towards this idea that business ethics ought to incorporate the idea of social responsibility that yes businesses can make a profit but they ought not to do harm and that again this is really a movement from the legally based ethics that we're just going to do things that are legal right um to yeah we'll do everything that's legal but also we're going to do what's right and that and the recognition that was illegally right is not always morally right so in the case of united airlines he had the legal right to remove this customer but they did not act morally in the removal of that customer and so now they've had to change just to save their own butt otherwise you know they will lose market share and that and there's a recognition, generally speaking, in this integrity-based ethics movement that internal values breeds trust. And that it becomes, and if there is alignment and integrity is the idea of acting as one, so you don't have to become two separate people, you have these two different roles, right? Your business ethics and your personal ethics are at war with each other. The business recognizes that, you know, our values ought to be aligned and so people don't have to choose one way or another. They don't, you know, um, feel like they they don't, they have to check their values at the door, that, that business operations actually become more efficient and effective and that it affects positive company performance, a positive company reputation, product images, and it actually is, in the end, more profitable. So the bottom line is that with increased productivity, there are lower production costs. You might remember those uh, employees of Wells Fargo who you know, used medical leave in order to sort of deal with this pressure cooker environment. They, uh, there were costs to that. And also there were those who you know, became less productive because they just felt that you know, what they were being asked to do uh, were not aligned with their own values and then I'm sure there were others who basically dragged their feet through it and so um, that also translated into cost which affected profits but in the case of doing you know uh, ethical uh, business practices the argument is that it does increase productivity lowers production uh, production costs and then results in higher profits and that it also yields greater customer loyalty which you know is, is uh, which leads to trust so for example in the case of united airlines when businesses are seen as doing the right thing not necessarily exercising their legal rights but doing the right things it also yields trust and greater customer loyalty and that also then leads to positive brand image right and then the, the ability to then attract and retain talent as well as gain more customers and that the avoidance of negative public images also results in less marketing costs because you're not spending your you know your money trying to convince people that you really were not as bad as it looked so in the case of United Airlines, for example, they're going to have to spend quite a bit of marketing dollars to help people rethink about their image, as well as Wells Fargo. You can imagine that's going to cost in millions and that, you know, by avoiding the negative public image in the first place, you'll be able to retain and maybe even expand the very market share that, you know, you intend to have. And that being able to, you know, you know, um, to do ethically good things as a business will also yield new opportunities because you're seen as a business that people want to do business with and you might then attract new ventures so for example anyone who wants to do business with wells fargo may want to rethink about associating themselves with wells fargo until the fog of you know fraud and unethical practices sort of disappears so until then, companies are going to pretty much be hands off. So doing business good really is also doing public good because now those two are seen as sort of shaking hands. And so now let's tie this back to Wells Fargo and the lessons learned there. And so the idea of values 
and how they really do drive culture and then the exercise of ethics or in, the, in their case, the lack thereof. And in the case of Wells Fargo, they did write certain values in their brochures, but they executed a very different set within their everyday operations, which drove them to create, you know, two million fake accounts and ignore their uh, a main pillar of their uh, value set, which was ethics. And that in order to, um, you know, have your values actually become real and manifest themselves in your everyday operations so that the company in this case has integrity, it does require courage to follow through and it starts from the top so that, for example, your employees do not have to exercise their own courage in order to align their personal ethics with, you know, their business ethics. So there isn't this war between what the business is asking the employees to do and what the employees, you know, feel compelled to do. All right. And that in the end, unethical business practices cause people to morally disengage. And that's why thousands of employees in Wells Fargo ultimately, you know, created these fake accounts, which in the end were costly and unsustainable because they were ultimately found out. And that um, not only were they legally unacceptable, they were also morally unacceptable by the stakeholders involved and in business as is in life integrity is this idea of oneness with your values and doing the right thing whether anyone uh, is looking is really a measure of character and that companies have character and in the case of wells fargo they now have to you know reconsider who they really are as a company and why symbolically i think that brochure became very simple and sort of reminiscent of you know when they were first established in 1852 and that their back page is now being pretty much a blank slate and reminding themselves who they really are as a company so what the wells fargo case teaches us as well as enron and the united airlines incident is that ethics at the center of it is really this notion of to do no harm and so while organizations may have sort of the legal right to do a thing, the question of morality really is this, you know, idea of whether or not the act does harm. And the greater movement and trend in businesses now is to move away from legally based, you know, initiatives as far as ethics is concerned to one that is value driven or what we now know as integrity driven that we act with integrity and to, you know, uh, to be aligned with our values, not only internally to the organization, but also what our stakeholders see as acceptable. And so this ends part one, and I will come back uh, with part two in another video. Thank you very much.